So happy to have you uh, again uh, in the series on uh, theories of regulation and governance. This time a presentation by Melissa Rory and Benjamin Van Ruij uh, on measuring compliance. The sub subtitle is the, the challenge of assessing and understanding the interaction between law and organizational uh, misconduct. Benjamin, as you all know, is a professor of law and society at the uh, University of uh, Amsterdam. He is also global professor of law at the University of California, uh, Irwin, Irwin, and he's also co-editor of the journal Regulation and Government. Melissa Rory is associate professor of criminal justice at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Her uh, research predominantly examined the impact of uh, formal and informal control on corporate and why white collar offending. And uh, she's also, also theories uh, of, of elite crimes and corporate uh, non-compliance. Uh, she got uh, many awards um, and you will have the, now the opportunity to, to hear uh, her now. So uh, Melissa and Benjamin, please uh, start. All right, so I believe, Benjamin, I'm going to do my 15, 16 minute spiel and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, so let me see if I can share my screen for everyone. All right, can everybody see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so basically we're all here today because Benjamin and I have recently submitted an edited volume that examines methodological issues in compliance research. And we're actually working through the copy edits right now. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll have that out in print in the next uh, probably four to five months, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, and so this presentation today is really based on the first chapter of the book in which we outline why we think this discussion is particularly important. And so just to provide some background on this, you know, we know all as, as uh, regulatory scholars that we've seen incentives and sometimes laws that mandate corporations to adopt programs that ensure compliance with laws and regulations. In other words, to prevent corporate crime, right? Um, so there's the U.S. Sentencing Guidelines for Corporations that offered reductions in minimum sentences for corporations that have a compliance program in place. Um, or we see that having a compliance program in place can reduce regulatory monitoring. And more recently, and in response to these criticisms that these programs, that these compliance programs are really superficial, that they're symbolic, that they're ultimately ineffective, um, agencies have really recognized that it's not just enough to have a compliance program. There should also be some determination of whether or not the program is effective or not. You know, in other words, some way to measure whether corporate malfeasance is really being prevented. Um, and in addition to government pressures, there's been increased attention to corporate crime and to corporate social responsibility in academic circles. But notably, and this is one of the main arguments of our book, is that researchers working in this domain often operate in different silos um, from each other. So we have researchers working very differently from each other, as well as from practitioners who are also conducting evaluations on their corporations. Um, and within these silos, People prioritize certain conceptualizations of non-compliance and compliance, certain research methods over others, those sorts of things, without really a comprehensive review of the different strengths and limitations of the methods as they relate to compliance research. So our upcoming book, and the title's here, it's called Measuring Compliance, Assessing Corporate Crime and Misconduct Prevention, really seeks to provide such a review for corporate crime scholars, regulatory scholars, as well as compliance practitioners. Um, alike. And so, so this is basically what we're going to talk about today in our presentation. Um, and this is really what guided the development of the book. And we're essentially highlighting the trade-offs associated with various measurement mechanisms as it relates to corporate non-compliance. Um, and so we're first going to discuss briefly what we see as the four methodological challenges in the study of, of corporate crime and compliance. Um, we're going to detail which methods are really best suited and which ones are less well suited for overcoming these challenges. And we're going to finish the presentation with some thoughts on how to improve measurement of corporate compliance as a whole. And so let's start off with the four challenges in measuring corporate crime. 
First of all, we have conceptual challenges. And ultimately, what we're saying is that the term corporate compliance really means different things to different people. And definitions of the term often hinge on two things. One, who are you, right? If you're a regulator or a law enforcement official, if you're a corporation that's subject to laws or regulations, if you're another stakeholder, that position really dictates your view of compliance. Secondly, you know, what type of law are you referring to? Are you referring to civil, regulatory, or criminal law? Are you referring to informal law versus formal law? And then, you know, and, and, and lastly, and we have a great chapter on the governance turn in our, in our book, um, we know that the governance turn means that governments have increasingly turned over monitoring of corporations to companies and private parties who can then define and measure compliance in a way that really kind of suits their interests. And as a result of this conceptual ambiguity with so many people looking at compliance in different ways, data on corporate behavior is really highly variable from one source to another. And the methodological choices are related to the assumptions and biases of the data source and ultimately make it very difficult to compare data sets to one another or to assess reliability and validity. So secondly, is what we call the dark figure, right? And, and anybody who studies criminology or criminal justice knows that almost one of the fundamental laws of criminology is that official records of crime, so crimes reported to the police, are really kind of a woeful undercounting of how much crime actually occurs. And the variation, you know, the difference between recorded and actual behavior uh, really depends on the type of crime we're talking about. So auto theft in the United States, at least, are almost a perfect uh, uh, accounting of how much auto theft actually occurs because insurance won't pay out unless you report it to the police. Um, on the other hand, sexual assaults have historically been among, amongst the most underreported. In fact, in 2018, uh, it's estimated that only a quarter of sexual assaults are reported to the police. Although we don't have any statistics on the dark figure of corporate crime per se, we know that internal mechanisms are preferred for handling this misconduct and as such, a lot of corporate crime simply doesn't reach the ears of regulatory or law enforcement agencies. Complicating things further is that many victims of corporate crime don't even realize that they've been victimized or, uh, or, or may consider these things to be accidents or negligence and not even realize that, that these behaviors are really punishable by either regulators or law enforcement. Um, you know, even when victims of corporate crime are aware of their victimization, they may fear retaliation from their peers or bosses if they report. Um, and then also, you know, we know that businesses, we know that corporations will often kind of um, take a buyer beware approach, which also means that victims are kind of blaming themselves uh, for their crimes, so they may not report it. Third, uh, you know, we talk about establishing a causal relationship. And, you know, in everyday life, we use the word cause to mean something that brings about an effect or result. But scientifically, we have fairly strict criteria for determining that A actually causes B. And specifically, to establish that causal relationship scientifically, it's not enough to simply observe that a change in one factor is associated with a change in compliance. Uh, so obviously, there's that old saying, correlation does not equal causation. So in addition to demonstrating this observable empirical relationship, one must also determine the time ordering of the relationship, uh, you know, which one came first, you know, the compliance or the alleged predictor of compliance, as well as eliminating other rival explanation, which is known as non-spuriousness. And so those three criteria are bolded in this slide because they are those mandatory criteria that you have to establish in a scientific study to establish causality. Um, however, those other two things, causal mechanism and context, are also really important. Um, the causal uh, con mechanism, excuse me, the causal mechanism is basically the explanation for by for why A causes B, um, and that helps support claims of causality. Um, and then the context, of course, is, is under what conditions does the relationship exist, and knowing when the relationship exists and when it doesn't is very helpful in terms of establishing causality as well. And then finally, um, you know, this is kind of a, a two-parter here. Uh, we have this issue of, of having really almost too much data uh, from a lot of different sources. And as I mentioned before, each one really has 
different strengths, limitations, biases, and really vary in terms of their complexity. And then relatedly, but somewhat different, there are a lot of existing studies of corporate compliance. Uh, and all of these studies take different definitions of compliance. They use different def methods. They might use different samples or populations. And as is true for many scientific endeavors, different studies on the same research question are likely to come to different conclusions based on the conceptual and methodological decisions of the researcher. So these are the four main issues that we believe exist when, when really trying to study corporate compliance. And in the book, we really asked our authors to clearly lay out the strengths and weaknesses of the method they were writing about. And overall, we make the point that there is no perfect single research method. Instead, it's much more important to match your research method to your research question. And as all researchers know, the research question should really be dictating the methods used to collect data. In reality, though, it's kind of a different picture. Um, often the data that is available can dictate the research question being asked, or we see sometimes that the method may not be adequate for answering the research question. So we argue that corporate crime researchers really do need to focus on making sure that the method addresses the research topic of interest. And ultimately, researchers should be asking themselves four different questions. So number one, are you interested in studying how compliance is conceptualized by various parties, or do you have a set definition of compliance that you are trying to predict? Number two, are you concerned with actual non-compliance, or is your research able to be answered with non-compliance that comes to the attention of law enforcement? Number three, do you want to firmly establish that X causes Y? For example, maybe that a compliance program really does improve compliance, even after controlling for other explanations. Or is your research question more descriptive or exploratory in nature? And then finally, the last question, how do we make sense of the data and research that's already out there? And so those are the sorts of questions that we're going to talk about now. So that first question, are you interested in studying how compliance is conceptualized by various parties, or do you have a set definition of compliance that you're ultimately trying to use to explain something? If it's the former, if you're interested in studying variations in, in conceptualization, qualitative methods like the ones listed here are really ideal for exploring nuanced understandings of a phenomenon. But a lot of research uses existing data without detailing how the source defines compliance. And existing data is fine to use if you have a set definition of compliance that matches how the data was collected. The problem is when you're trying to use existing data and, and also understand how conceptualization varies from one party to another. Number two, you know, this dark figure issue, right? Are you concerned with actual non-compliance or is your research question satisfactorily answered with non-compliance that comes to the intention of law enforcement? Again, here, qualitative methods are going to be the best for observing and recording the dark figure of crime because they can really get into the environment and observe crimes um, either as they've been observed by other people or actually have the, uh, the researcher go in and observe them themselves. Um, existing data usually is created through some sort of filter, and so behaviors are probably going to be left out of the report if you're using existing data. So establishing a causal relationship, that third question, do you want to firmly establish that A causes B, that a compliance program really does improve compliance, or is your research question more descriptive or exploratory in nature? So here, randomized control trials are generally lauded as being the gold standard in program evaluation because they really are the only method that can kind of assume away alternative explanations when random assignment to groups are successful. Ethnographies, interestingly, although they are qualitative in nature, can also be argued to establish causality in a very specific social setting under study. However, we know that a lot of compliance researchers uh, research uses cross-sectional surveys and existing data, which are inherently limited in establishing those three mandatory criteria for causality that I talked about earlier. 
And then finally, you know, this idea of having really too much data and a lot of studies that are already out there, how do we make sense of it all? Um, so there are very few meta-analyses of corporate non-compliance. I'm lucky enough to have been a co-author on one of those meta-analyses, um, but it's important to note that systematic reviews and meta-analyses are very good at merging data from previous studies to kind of come to an overall conclusion of what the body of literature says about a topic. And if there are enough studies out there to include in a meta-analysis, it can actually examine how differences in methodological choices and samples actually impact the results that you get. Um, and then regarding the limitations of existing data, we know that it can be really problematic to use existing data, and yet that's probably the most common method of examining corporate crime and compliance. And so ultimately, you know, we're going to use what we have available to us, but authors should really consider triangulating their findings from existing data with another form of direct data collection. And then, of course, you know, there are two more considerations. You guys thought I was done. There are actually two more considerations that really do need to be considered whenever you engage in research. So number one is really generalizability. Can your study's findings be applied to other people or settings aside from the ones that actually participated in your study? And then number two, feasibility. How much time and money is the data collection going to take? So let's talk about generalizability really briefly. If you uh, ultimately, if you care about taking your findings and talking about them as though they apply to a large population of people, surveys are often the best way to do so because you can send them out to a large group of people and you can use probability sampling designs to decrease the bias in your sample. In other words, you can make it look more like the overall population that you are interested in. Um, However, notably, there's often a sacrifice between generalizability and being able to get more valid data. Um, you know, those methods that are better at establishing causality or at getting authentic non-compliance measures are simply going to take more time and money to do, which reduces your ability to access large and representative groups of people. And then relatedly, you know, uh, uh, we know that money is really tight for practitioners. We know that money is really tight for academics. And the pressure to produce findings doesn't really seem to abate even when resources are lacking. Um, and so existing data and surveys are the easiest and least expensive research that you can do. While, of course, the same methods I just talked about on the last slide require more effort, and that's, of course, also going to increase the time and money necessary. So this is a figure, and David, I believe this is the, the main diagram that you wanted us to be discussing here, and that's basically what I've done uh, to this point. So this figure is in our book, and it's really our attempt uh, to do, and I'll give Benjamin all the credit for this. He basically put this together himself, um, but it's our attempt to, to pictorially situate the various methods according to their strengths. So main points, no single method is perfect. Um, and it's mainly just really important that researchers think carefully about the research question of interest and what methods can help them get the answer that they are looking for. Also, we need to make sure that our quest for perfection doesn't kill progress. You know, despite the limitations of these methods, all research can make a contribution to the literature, and we really should be encouraging researchers to do the best that they can, while also discouraging researchers from overselling the capabilities of their study. And so in conclusion, we have some thoughts on where corporate uh, compliance research can really go from here. Our main suggestion is to use mixed methods approaches. And there's a great chapter by Alexandra Jordanaska and Nicholas Lord in our book um, that really goes through mixed methods and what this looks like. Um, but basically, a mixed method study incorporates both qualitative and quantitative data collection methods, which you might have seen throughout the presentation. Those two things are often pitted against each other in terms of what they are good at and in terms of what they might not be as well suited for. So when you combine a qualitative method with a quantitative method to examine one research question, and if you do both of those types of methods rigorously and well, you can often overcome a lot of the limitations in both methods. We also, of course, because we are <laughs> researchers, recommend that more time and money can be made available for this type of research, which I'm sure everybody in this audience will agree with, right? Um, but 
if money continues to be an issue, then we think that existing data could be improved or could be made more readily available for compliance scholars. Um, and there are new statistical methods out there like Monte Carlo data simulations. Again, there's another chapter in our book that describes that, um, that can help explore existing data in such a way that improves our confidence in the findings. And then finally, uh, you know, one of the most, we all know that one of the most kind of effortful parts of engaging in this research is actually accessing people within companies. You know, these are the people who can tell you about actual misconduct, who can participate in compliance programs geared towards preventing corporate crime, and can explain to you how they define compliance in their everyday lives. Unfortunately, it seems pretty rare to have compliance and academic partnerships that would really facilitate such access at less cost, right? Um, so we do encourage practitioners and scholars to think of ways that they can collaborate. And then, of course, you know, as a part of this, we recognize that there will be concerns about conflicts of interest and the ability of a researcher to produce uncensored reports. There is also the question of legal liability and what might happen if the researcher uncovers major forms of corporate noncompliance. That said, we know that scholars and compliance practitioners have the same goal. You know, they ultimately want to gain knowledge about how to improve compliance and protect people from harm. Um, and so ultimately, we believe that if both parties you know, agree on what the outcome of interest is and how to handle noncompliance in a transparent or ethical manner, and oftentimes, you know, institutional review board or other kind of ethics review organization um, can help navigate these sorts of discussions, then we ultimately don't think that adversarial relationships have to be a given in this research domain. And so that concludes the presentation part of this webinar. Um, here's my contact information. I believe it's also available, uh, David, on your site. Um, if you're interested in seeing the table of contents from the book, don't hesitate to, to email me. I'm more than happy to share that. And then uh, Benjamin and I both have a couple of the chapters, including the one that this one, this presentation is based on. We have a couple of chapters up on SSRN as well as ResearchGate. Um, but that concludes. Thank I will you very much, Chairman. Do you want to add a few words? Benjamin? Um, sure. I mean, um, um, so, so I think um, in general, the, the, the key challenge that we're all facing, both in research and in practice, is that we're dealing with illegal behavior that has a complex set of causes that somehow we're, we're asked to uh, develop general, I mean, generalizable ideas about what is causing it. So that's summarizing these core challenges. And I felt a lot of times, this has been the elephant in the room in a lot of discussions, both about compliance and about regulation. So if I just look at the academic side, a lot of the work we do, we act as if what we've measured is actual compliance. And very often it isn't. It's what people said was compliant now, on a survey. It's what regulators found to be compliant during inspections. It doesn't mean it's the real thing. So I think often, and this is the dark number problem that I think is still the largest problem, we've sort of accepted this situation. And I think it's fine to accept that situation, but I do think we need to look at actually what we've been doing. I think there to kind of get all these different experts in one book and, everybody, and ask everybody from their own perspective, from the experience they have with their own methods, to look at what are the strengths, but also what are the weaknesses, even though they've been engaging in that work themselves. And Melissa and I have pushed them on this. I mean, they try to, I mean, some try to write chapters like, oh, this is great, and this is great, this is great. Yes, but now also let us in on the other side. I think that's just something we need to be doing. I mean, just hearing about some of the I mean, I mean, I mean, these are things not covered in the book, but just the trust in science, just hearing the news coming up yesterday about Dan Ariely's work. I mean, the trust in social science requires us to be honest. So also when we're talking with people in practice about measurement, first thing we got to say is, look, there is no perfect measurement. The second thing you got to say is ask, I mean, do you really want to know or do you just want to show something? I think it's those types of questions that we, we made the book. For me, I mean, I mean, the one thing I would add to what, what Melissa has said, everything I just said is just, re just repeating it in a different way. One thing I would really add for me, it's all about trade-offs. 
So the the scheme that we made jointly, I mean, uh, I, I may have started it, but it, it, it sure it surely wouldn't have been like it is now uh, if, we hadn't, if, if, if we hadn't worked on it so hard together. That scheme is really trying to map sort of where you find trade-offs. And it's sort of in one way you can sort of see, okay, this is the research I always do. This is where it is. Oh, maybe there's other kinds of research that I could combine with that. Final word on mixed methods. It's not easy. I've been in projects, for instance, the first time I did a, I did a project with Carlos Lowe. So I've done some earlier papers with Carlos and Carlos is, a, I mean, he became a quantitative scholar doing surveys on regulatory law enforcement in China. And I was doing qualitative work and we got completely opposite findings. So he would say, and, that, and he was writing that, well, your work is not representative, which it wasn't. And I would say, maybe not say it out loud, but think, well, your work isn't valid. It's just what these regulators have been telling you. And, and they've only talked to you once on the survey. I talked to them 11 times. And by time two or three, they start, say, they start saying different things than the first two times. So it's those conversations that we need to be having, but there is a risk to it. Once you have mixed methods, sometimes you can't make sense of the data you get. Yet, we still argue strongly in the book for understanding these trade-offs. And the only solution we see is to do work on mixed methods. Anyway, we look forward to see what you think. There's much more detail, obviously, in the book than we can give credit for in our, in our chapter, which just introduces it. So if you really want to deep dive on any of the methods, please um, go and look in the book. I think many of the chapters will be on SSRN, um, but the book itself should be out uh, early next year. Thank you very much. Both the uh, questions and comments are most welcome. So you can uh, register or just uh, enter the discussion. We are a small group. Uh, uh, shall I go ahead, David, with a question? Yes, please. Who is that? Yeah, yeah. this is Sachin, Sachin Margade. Yeah, please, Sachin. Yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Melissa and Benjamin. Thanks a lot for this very interesting work uh, that you're doing. So we are in India and we are also trying to uh, work out uh, research around compliance, regulatory compliance studies. But the question uh, you rightly mentioned that we really don't know what is happening behind the curtain and, and uh, uncovering that is almost like another level of investigation you might get into. Uh, so in, in that case, uh, we always often take help of uh, what we call proxy indicators that maybe we're not able to uh, directly measure something. So we might want to use some proxy, uh, for example, procedural, you know, variables, whether uh, the, the programs are transparent enough, you know, what kind of participation is there in that program. So uh, what about, uh, do you discuss that also in your research and, and what is your take on that? Thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, shall I go first with this or do you want to go? Sure. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay, so we have one chapter on outcome variables, which is a little bit different than what you mentioned as, pro as sort of procedural indicators. So outcome variables, for instance, they work quite well when you're looking at compliance with occupational health and safety, uh, health and safety regulations. Then you can look at the number of accidents. I mean, accidents don't always mean that there is a non-compliance situation, but obviously accidents is the clear impact thing that compliance would want to achieve. Um, but the chapter is more at a, uh, it discusses that more at a larger aggregate level. So not at the level of the individual firm, uh, but at the level of data that are in larger jurisdictions. It was a chapter written by people who've worked for the OECD and the World Bank. So that's partly discussed. I think the procedural indicators, that gets us to causality. What do we actually know about whether participation leads to more or less compliance? Sure, it can be seen as a necessary um, um, a condition for compliance. If you don't participate, maybe you don't get compliance. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure it's not a sufficient condition. So simply the participating of itself won't lead to more compliance. So I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant of using, and, and our book is really about behavioral change. It's not about um, compliance with uh, the procedures in a compliance system. That's not what, what the book is about. I mean, some people use the term compliance 1.0 and 2.0. Ours is clearly 2.0. It's clearly about achieving a change for better. 
it's not just about uh, checking the boxes and checking whether we have checked the boxes. Yeah, and if I could add to that, Benjamin, um, just to, I'm not going to try not to repeat what you just said, but ultimately, you know, that's been the criticism of these programs is that they're being measured by number of trainings provided, by the number of people participating in these programs, you know, and ultimately to the people who are looking for actual behavioral change in corporations, we're not actually getting at that, right? And so this speaks to our, our, our discussion of conceptualization as well, which is, you know, how do you really conceptualize compliance and are you actually measuring compliance or are you simply assuming that compliance is going to follow as a result of those uh, procedural kind of measurements that you're talking about? And, you know, ultimately those assumptions are fine um, as long as you're making it very clear that those are in fact assumptions that you're making right and so one thing that we haven't really talked about much here um, but is very much an underlying kind of fundamental point of our book is also about transparency and being really transparent about the research that you're doing and what you are able to say and what you're not able to say as a result of the research that you're doing and ultimately and this is some i teach research methods every single semester and that's ultimately when you look at science in the news when you look at how science is being reported in an everyday uh, in our everyday lives there's a real lack of transparency about the samples being used about the research methods being done and what they are capable of and not capable of so to speak to your point about those procedural things it's fine to use those as long as you're very aware and very transparent about what you are actually measuring and what you're simply assuming results from that but great question thank you for that yeah thank you thanks a lot yeah uh, more questions comments michael michael levy please yeah hi uh, apologize uh, i missed the first chunk of the uh, presentation but um what do we do in situations where nobody knows clearly what the goals are um, and therefore the criteria that they're supposed to be complying with uh, perhaps obviously perhaps not I'm thinking about money laundering um, uh, controls where um, I and Peter Roger and Terry Halliday um, have uh, argued that nobody really has the remotest idea uh, what the system is there for, except that it's somehow intrinsically good to control global bads. Um, and the connection between formal compliance with what you're told to do and what might be plausible goals of regulation um, is therefore unclear. I think that exactly gets to the first point we made, which is the conceptual point. So there is a body of compliance research, it's sometimes called endogenous research. I think it's a term that Christine Parker and Vivica Nielsen uh, developed. If you, if you have a, um, an interest in those questions, I think you can have those questions virtually, virtually in every compliance field. I think in every, every, every jurisdiction or every type of set of rules, there can be questions about what is actually the goal? Do we agree about those? And of course, there's also legal ambiguity in any system, um, which means there's going to be different interpretation, even amongst similar actors. Uh, if you're interested in those questions, you obviously need to have a design of study that focuses on that. And then mostly qualitative research works best. You could also design a survey that gets to that. Uh, but probably you could only do so after you've done an, an, an exploratory, um, a qualitative study. So I think um, if you're in fields where those questions are so pertinent as you now describe them, it's not very wise to jump ahead of those and immediately get to conceptualize things that there's no agreement about, where you end up as a researcher defining what is compliance, which may not be at all how it's defined in the fields that you're studying. And this is the exact point I think that Christine Parker and Vivica Nielsen made in their 2009 article, which uh, covered some of the compliance challenges that we're also, also talking about in the book. Uh, Beata, do you want to, um, to speak out? I know that you cannot uh, open the, the camera, or, but maybe you want to, to ask. Uh, Beata? Yes, please. 
Um, yes, I, I think it's a very nice to, um, just a moment, I am working with my camera. Um, it's very nice to um, raise these issues about uh, compliance and research of compliance. But the question is, um, what, what actually new you have uh, brought uh, with uh, researchers? Because in fact, we know already a long time that uh, mixed uh, research method is uh, better and um, if it's possible to combine. But can you combine all this? Huh? Because uh, some questions uh, for quantitative message are very much uh, for, um, for instance, establishing uh, big trends or and only uh, answering questions uh, yes or no, for instance, and, and, and then explanations uh, or, or of how did it happen, for instance, uh, are more qualitative. And so, uh, in fact, we are dealing with different kind of research questions for different methods. And uh, I believe that uh, Professor Perry Six uh, can uh, uh, better <laughs> than I explain here, but. Uh, I wonder what is the contribution here, actually, and uh, because it it it, uh, it seems to me at a very general level still. Thank you, Beata. Uh, Melissa, Benjamin. I can start, Benjamin, if you want me to. And ultimately, it's a great question. Um, and so, really, you know, this is this is a very limited, small in scope presentation on a very large edited handbook um, that does more than simply talk about mixed methods, but really does try to bring together the different methodological strategies that compliance researchers and practitioners, and I will emphasize that because we did make sure that it is written at a level that is accessible to people who might not have PhDs and have already gone through a research methods program. So our larger contribution, I feel, is really putting, bringing these different foci together into one place where somebody can very easily pick the book up off the shelf, you know, virtually or in, or, or in real life or whatever, um, and can look through it and say, okay, this is the research question I have. How do I really measure it and get at it at its, you know, in a way that is best suited for the type of research question that I'm looking at? And so mixed methods is just one recommendation that we have. Um, you know, it's one chapter that we have out of a lot of different, I think 16 different chapters in the book, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but, you know, speaking to your point about mixed methods too, Ultimately, you know, they are so qualitative and quantitative methods are thought of as being well suited for different research questions, but they also can speak to different aspects of the same research question. So if you think about establishing causality, again, randomized experiments are thought of as like the gold standard. Um, and yet randomized experiments are often really bad at figuring out why factor A causes factor B. And so you would really need to get in there, do interviews with the people who are undergoing that intervention to understand what it was about that training that made them change their mind and, and change their behavior, right? Um, so they're not necessarily always just about different research questions. They can often be used to, to complement one another and answer the same research question, um, taking different perspectives and really, again, filling in those gaps that's left by uh, using a single method. Um, Benjamin, do you have something to add? Yeah, if I can add to that on the academic side. So I think the main contribution of the book is to provide a critique of how we've been doing compliance research. So I think a lot of compliance research has not really thought enough about the choice of methods to link to the research question. They just had a certain method or a certain approach. Second, we haven't been critical enough about these challenges. We've accepted as a field data that inherently is very limited to tell us something about compliance. And we all do that because well, there is nothing else. So I think that critique in of itself is a major thing that needed to be done for us to be much more explicit and much more aware of the choices we make and the limits we have. So for instance, a paper that uses survey data uh, on compliance, it will get through review because, um, and, and there's nothing wrong with a paper like that, but it will get through review and be published without going deeply into what sort of bias can you get in self-reported data? 
because it's very hard to answer that question. But there is a bias. There are, are people who, who, who will lie about, about, um, about um, being, in non I mean, being in compliance. There's even boasters, people who will on surveys fill out things that they state they're in compliance, even, sorry, in non-compliance, even though they're not. There used to be really good rigorous research about this, for instance, in studies of tax compliance in the 1980s. But somehow as a field, we haven't really developed in compliance a methodological grammar. So um, if you look, for instance, at the last big paper on this, that was Parker and Nielsen. So there isn't a lot of writing, this sort of meta writing where we're sort of thinking about what is it that we're doing? How are we doing this? What are the limits in this? Of course, the things you find, we know generally in social science. I mean, there's nothing strange or different about compliance in that. It's just bringing those questions and those ideas smack in the middle of, of the field of compliance. Broader for regulatory studies, a lot of regulatory studies papers, so the ones that are not focused on compliance, they sort of indirectly talk about compliance. As soon as you say regulation will be effective, as soon as you say regula regulation will do X, will achieve this, you're again making the same sort of jumps. And I see that as editor of the journal, I see a lot of papers making, making causal jumps or making claims about data where we don't really have strong data about legal or illegal behavior that just don't make a lot of sense. So our book, as I see it, and the urgency that I see it, that it should come out, is really to start this methodological conversation in compliance and more broadly in regulation that also focuses on behavior. In criminology, this it has been a conversation all along. But I see in our field, we don't really do it. And that's why we did the book. And, and it's not a judgmental book. Every method has its problems, every single method, but we need to talk about them. Sorry, Melissa, go ahead. No, it's okay. I just wanted to, to just not, not to get the final word on this, but I will say, I think one of the big kind of anecdotal um, evidence, if you will, of what a contribution this really is, is that our authors really struggled with the fundamental limitations of are we actually measuring compliance? Like we had really world renowned scholars who just simply like they couldn't, they couldn't really come up with an answer for how this method can address uh, this 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 issue. Um, and so I think this is actually, you know, I think the contribution of this book, as Benjamin said, is really bringing this to the forefront of the compliance scholarship and, and again, challenging what we're thinking about when we do research. And, you know, um, I also will say, we obviously have our training and oftentimes our training is is somewhat limited in terms of the types of methods that we um, that we use and therefore limits the types of research questions that we're asking. And so hopefully we're 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 also um, making people feel more comfortable with exploring kind of additional research questions um, that they might pursue in addition to the ones that they're already re really comfortable with. Because there's a lot of research questions, there are a lot of research questions out there that simply aren't being looked at as they should be. Um, sorry, Benjamin, I didn't... The... I, mean, I'm, I mean, just one image I always had with the book. I mean, we're, the book sort of showed what it is like for blind men to capture an elephant. That's sort of what we get. We're all blind men with the elephant. I know it's a cliche, but that's what it is. And we see that these blind men haven't been talking to each other. Mm -hmm. So we see that some of the people who do mostly qualitative research, they don't really talk to people deeply enough who do uh, experiments, let alone people who do Monte Carlo simulations. So that's what we try to be. We try to get them together and show a fuller picture. Anyway, thanks for that comment because it helps us again to yep. make that also stronger uh, in our presentations. Well. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, Melissa. And uh, I see uh, Lota is raised in her end. Lota Larsen, please. Yes, hello. And thank you for a very interesting paper here. I'm not much of a regulation scholar. I'm a social anthropologist being very interested in tax compliance. And I heard recently about a method where basically to do the mixed methods, and I want to ask you about if you try that, of that you have the quantitative output and then you make people who have participated in qualitative research to comment on the quantitative results to see the input. And I, I was thinking about, you said, Melissa, in your presentation there that you struggle with having, I think it was you who said that, struggle with having completely opposite results, right? From the quantitative to, to the qualitative. 
Have you tried that? That was actually Benjamin, so I'll let him. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah. No, 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 that's fine. I love being taking credit for Benjamin's work, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, so for me, that, that that is ideal. I mean, I've been in sessions, for instance, I was once teaching a um, the fine is a price paper by Gnisi and Rusticini. And I was doing that together with an economist of law. And we were looking at the sort of, I mean, the data is clear and we can have all kinds of debates about that paper and the data, but let's leave that aside. Let's assume the data is valid. What causes some, I mean, in daycare centers, pay, I mean, I mean, parents to come later uh, when a fine is introduced. Well, they have a sort of deductive reasoning for that from economics where they sort of say, and, and, and I mentioned then when I, I mean, to my co-teacher, I mentioned, why don't we ask these people who were in the experiment? And he literally said, well, that would be very messy. <laughs> so that's, that's the culture. I mean, there's a very good book on, on research culture called Two Cultures. The quantitative, I mean, the hardcore, more, more economist a scholar doesn't want to really look in the human mind because, I mean, I mean, ask the human because that's messy. And the anthropologist on the other side, and then more there, is not very comfortable with the numbers or just thinking deductively. And that's sort of why it's so hard to do this. And yes, you're right. I mean, your comment that could have been a methodology for our book is that we would mix everybody up, that we would ask people uh, from uh, different methods to reflect on others, other methods. Uh, and I think what you say, ideally for me, an ideal research starts qualitative to understand conceptualization, the conceptualization, to understand process, to understand how it's something works, to understand the language, to understand maybe assumptions, then I'll personalize that into something, maybe a survey or an experiment. And then you do follow-up interviews or focus groups or whatever to understand the results. So that that is optimal. And that is also discussed in the mixed methods uh, chapter. We just don't have a lot of research like that. So I've supervised two PhDs um, uh, who did things that, that, that did fit that. So one paper that just came out in the Journal of Business Ethics by Lina that I co-authored. She combined doing surveys with individual workers to look at, at how they um, comply with, with worker safety regulation in China um, in, in construction industry with doing in-depth observation of these workers with in-depth uh, uh, participant observation with both regulators and compliance managers. So she has all the actors, she has the processes. That was three years of work. Yeah. You are seeing Michael uh, and also Malcolm. So both of you, uh, uh, one after another, please do it shortly. Uh, Michael, please start. Sure. Um, isn't it also though an issue of your subject culture? Um, economists um, may be frightened uh, that if they adopt mixed methods and start talking to people, their professional colleagues uh, will find that too untrustworthy. Yep. <laughs> well, that's 100% true. I, I work a lot with psychologists and I'm, and I'm running this team of psychologists and actually teaching some of them to do in-depth um, um, interviews. And it's sort of a career killer for them uh, because it's very hard for them to present their work to psychologists. And, and psychologists, I think, are a little bit more open, maybe even than economists, to at least talk to humans. I mean, they're trained to do that. Um, but still, I'm finding how hard that is. So you're right. It's it's not just culture. It's it's it's. I mean, I mean, it depends on what you call culture. But it's very explicit in incentives in the journals in what you can and cannot publish. No, you're right. It's also sanctions. Malcolm. Please. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Benjamin and Melissa, yeah, thanks for this. It's a, a broad ranging and very ambitious uh, project that you're doing apparently. Um, so I look forward to seeing it. Um, my, my guess is that the audience you anticipate is mostly academic researchers and it's about comparative research methods. Um, but given that the subject is compliance measurement, um, there's an intensely practical issue that could be an opportunity for uh, academic and practitioner uh, collaboration. In my work with all kinds of regulatory agencies, they're intensely interested in knowing whether what they did or do uh, benefits compliance rates. And uh, then I point out to them, well, your audits and inspections are all risk focused and therefore you can't 
infer from that the underlying compliance rate because of the confounding targeting. Um, and they're dismayed by that. Um, so then I have to do a little bit of work to try and persuade them. Um, but you'd need to incorporate a random or representative element, preferably deep audits uh, um, on a representative sample uh, from which you could make proper extrapolations. Uh, and, you know, if that's sort of 5% of your audit or inspection budget, it seems reasonable to guide the other 95%. Um, but it's incredibly difficult for them to just justify because the yield um, on the 5% is obviously lower. And um, it looks like a waste of resources if you think <laughs> just in terms of how to get the best out of what you have. Um, so I don't know whether you've um, thought about and, and the idea of running such a program and getting statistically valid metrics and using that to help guide and evaluate regulatory initiatives, um, that's not anything that an academic could do by themselves, even with permission to be there, because you have to get them to do the audits and inspections or data gathering and sampling and so on. Um, and they can't do it because they don't really understand the, um, the underlying uh, research problems that go with it. So that, that, that seems... Uh, a very practical down to earth um, issue. I don't know whether you've engaged that in your book. Um, if so, I'd love to read that section. I also, I have a, um, a second question if I may, and that's um, when you consider other regulatory structures, uh, compliance is however hard it is to define, it's much easier when you've got prescriptive regulation. Then you move on to performance-based or outcome-based regulation, then the rule says, let's say in building regulation, you must provide adequate, uh, adequate protection against moisture penetration. Um, so al almost no one knows how to do a quick and easy compliance measurement on that kind of requirement. And then you move even further towards the realm of self-regulation or SMS systems in particular. Um, if you look, I, I'm increasingly worried that compliance with SMS regulations is simple, quick and easy and basically meaningless. Um, because the rules are very brief, you know, four or five pages, for, uh, which says you must post the following documents. You've got to define the following things. You've got to submit any reports about reportable instances and accident, accidents. And, and you must run your own risk management system, but it could be completely lousy and ineffective, and you're utterly compliant with the SMS rules um, themselves because they are so superficial and document-based, and they don't really have anything to do with whether you're vigilant or properly evaluating risks or <laughs> effective in countering them. Uh, do you look at these other regulatory structures at all in your, in your work? So if I can start, um, let me start with the first point about the practitioner academic relationship. Um, we definitely in our book made sure to make it as accessible to practitioners as possible. Like we definitely asked our authors and, and edited when we went through the editing process, made sure that they were using language that was accessible, that they were explaining fairly complicated methodological processes in a simple way. Um, and ultimately, you know, like I said in the presentation, it's, it's, all research is worthwhile. Um, so we're really asking people to do what they can as rigorously as they can, but to also, you know, be very realistic about what they're capable of saying if they're doing research that is not, you know, not quite um, the gold standard using a randomized control trial or using a generalizable sample. Still, it's worthwhile and it's worth the resources that you devote to it, but you just have to be very on, uh, honest about, you um, about what you're capable of doing. So, so, so we did very much, and we are very much encouraging practitioners to read this book and to encourage collaborations between academics um, and, and, and practitioners as well. Um, as to your other question about, you know- Hold, hold on, before you leave that one. Yeah. Um, but there's a difference between, um, you know, understanding their life enough that they'll let you in so that you can do your work. Right. Um, versus right. understanding stuff they actually want help with. Well, right. the book has 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 at least two chapters by practitioners. Okay, so good. Benjamin has a chapter and Ricardo Pelafone has a chapter. Okay. Um, in other chapters, there are really, I mean, things that they can look at. I mean, also in response to your remark on this first point, yeah. one of the things that we see happening in the Netherlands 
is, um, and and I think it's also happened in, in, in some other countries, is we see these, these social science experts entering not only regulatory bodies, but also companies. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, two months ago, we did a talk with all these compliance experts in the Netherlands and Sally Simpson was there as a sort of foreign guest through, through the webinar on measuring compliance. Yeah. And, and you just see that there's companies who are working on the dark figure problem. Yeah, they yeah. actually hired a criminologist to look at that. There's, yeah. there's another company who asked me, can we be your guinea pig? We want to do this and that. They want to do ethnography, but they also yeah. want to test um, whether um, ethical dilemma training works, whatever it means yeah. or doesn't mean. Um, so, so the book actually aims to do this. Of course, it can't do it in enough detail. So that's sort of a how to do it. That would be, I think, uh, would require a different set of authors, uh, yeah. people who are much more in practice, but at least we did uh, get the people from practice involved in the book. They were also involved. I mean, all of this came out of the first compliance net conference where we had many of the authors there in Irvine three years ago, four years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and then we saw actually that we were all facing this sort of Babylonian task where, where people from practice were saying, look, we're doing A, B and C. And we were amazed with the things they were doing in practice. I mean, also, also you, Eugene Saltz's chapter shows some of the I mean, case studies that he from Harvard Business School has looked at, uh, for instance, at Microsoft, sort of how they're using new sorts of data. So there's a lot of innovation. I think the most interesting stuff is not happening in academia, actually. It is also not happening, happening with regulators. It's happening in corporations. Yeah. I mean, and they're closest to the data. Anyway, uh, sorry that I interrupted. Melissa. Oh, no, that's fine. I was just going to mention Eugene and Ricardo's chapters both talk about how to use existing data within corporations in very um, rigorous ways to really understand compliance. Um, yeah. And then just uh, uh, Malcolm, to your other question about the regulatory systems, we don't, you know, there's an entire chapter on the governance turn and kind of how changes in regulatory um, uh, uh, systems have impacted data and impacted kind of how we measure compliance. We don't, aside from that chapter, we don't spend a lot of time talking about the differences in regulation, but <laughs> the overall kind of overall theme of the book is really about compliance as a moving target, you know, um, the ways we control it, the ways we measure it, the way, ways we conceptualize it. And these methods, you know, depending on what compliance looks like, by a different person or by a different law or by a different or in a different regulatory system, these methods should be looked at as potential ways to assess compliance, no matter where you're coming from. Um, you know, so again, it's really about thinking about what is your research question? What does compliance look like to you? And how do you more fully understand it um, and whether or not it's actually happening? Uh, Benjamin, I don't know if you wanted to add to that part of the question. Well, I think Malcolm's point, the second point, look, it, and, and that's sort of what we also alluded to, but we don't go in depth into it. Um, the more ambiguity in the regulatory system, the more likely you will, you will get the first problem. And the more, also going, going back to Michael's earlier point, the more you need to start off with a conceptual research. I mean, if there's no, no understanding at all what it means to be in compliance, if there's no common understanding, it doesn't, make, it doesn't make any sense to go and measure it. Right? right. So then you need to you you then need to stick with understanding what then are these different conceptualizations or writing papers showing look this is so unclear nobody knows what they're doing and it's a sort of Babylonian of um, of 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 different understandings and then that, that's enough I think that's your contribution then also in practice maybe providing clarity on that but once you if you don't have that clarity it doesn't make sense to jump to measurement. And that's exactly where I think some of the current academic work and also work in practice goes wrong. It just jumps over it. It makes their own definition, even though it's not the definition that anybody agrees on or that actually is working in practice. And, the, and those are not new things we're saying, but combining them with the other things, I think is an important point in the methodological agenda that we're trying to set here. Okay, thanks. And this is uh, the time to say uh, I agree. And also thank you, Benjamin <laughs> and Melissa, and all of you who are participants in this session and all sessions of this uh, seminar. This uh, presentation will be on our YouTube channel soon, I think in a week time. And please subscribe to our uh, channel as well. 
thank you very much and have a nice uh, evening uh, in Europe and uh, nice day in the States uh, and all everywhere you are. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for hosting, David. Bye -bye. Thank you, David. Thank you.